we're uh, representing the Kalani Lake Research Station, and uh, today we're just going to share with you been conducted um, over the last uh, few, um, last season uh, at the station, and uh, and then walk you through some of the new projects that'll be coming up. So to start, I suppose uh, we'll just showcase where we are. So we're located about two and a half hours um, west of Whitehorse which is in Yukon uh, uh, territory in Canada. And so we, uh, uh, Whitehorse is accessible from uh, any European um, uh, airport. Um, and then it's a two and a half hour drive and we, uh, there's vehicles that can be rented, but we, we also facilitate uh, with vehicles from the station that we can come pick uh, people up. Um, and if you pop to the next one there, Harry. Um, so this is basically an overview of the facility. We're on the largest lake in the Yukon um, and uh, we sit on the uh, traditional territories of the Kluwani uh, First Nation, champagne Shack First Nation and White River First Nations um, and we are located uh, within the San Elias mountain range. Um, you can see a list of kind of just a, a, a quick breakdown of the facilities that we have um, we've got a, a, a large mess hall that seats about 40 people um, and a chef uh, that cooks for everyone, um, full washroom facilities, um, uh, and then most of the accommodation is all cabins. So we have a number of different cabins uh, that people can be distributed through. Uh, and we also have uh, a lab and some lounge areas and um, teaching spaces, so a full kind of like classroom style space. Um, you can go to the next one. Um, our lab is currently uh, being updated. Um, we had an existing lab, but it was just kind of um, outdated and needed to be updated. Uh, we've got funding to do the following um, updates, but they've obviously been put on hold um, because of the, uh, the pandemic. So uh, as soon as we get up and running, potentially um, this summer or in the fall, we'll be uh, installing all this equipment uh, to upgrade the labs. Um, so the types of research that we have at the station, we have uh, a large amount of glaciological research that's being conducted on the Kaskawalsh, Lowell, and uh, Donjek glaciers. So these are three glaciers that exist within about a 30 minute flight from the station. We, um, we, have, we, we sit on an active runway, uh, an airstrip, and so we have the ability for people to fly from the station directly to uh, these glaciers that are within about 30, 30 minutes or so. So um, there's two, uh, two scientists that I'd like to highlight that have done work at the station this this past summer, um, or this past year rather. Uh, so Dr. Christine Dow at the University of Waterloo uh, has conducted research on all three of the glaciers. Um, and uh, the big uh, piece that she was working on this summer, uh, or this uh, past year was that she dug the deepest uh, hole on a glacier in the Canadian uh, North um, at 375 meters deep to place uh, sensors at the, at the bottom and track the, the movement of the glacier. Uh, so this was a huge undertaking uh, with a lot of equipment being slung up by multiple helicopter trips. Uh, and um, so she's been able to place uh, several sensors within the glacier and then we'll hopefully recover them. Uh, the plan was to recover them this uh, uh, this summer, but obviously that's that's going to be put on hold, um, and so hopefully the following summer. Uh, and then she also has uh, uh, weather stations located on the glaciers. Um, and the other scientist that's been doing a lot of work on the glaciers is uh, Michel Barrier from um, University of Quebec, um, and he has several weather stations, time lapse cameras, um, and is and uh, is mostly monitoring the, um, the sedimentary movement 
uh, on the glacier. And so looking at a lot of the different rock formations that can inform past glacial movement. Uh, he's also doing a lot of uh, ice sampling and groundwater well installations, kind of similar to Christine, but, but um, a little bit shallower. Uh, and so this is ongoing um, and uh, hopefully we'll be producing some interesting results again whenever whenever he has access to his site again. Um, next. So the we have a fairly substantial wildlife biology program uh, with many different scientists from many different institutions. This has been going on for about 30 years uh, in the area. And so as far as wildlife biology is concerned, we have a enormous baseline of data that, uh, that's been secured uh, for s many different species. Uh, but we'll highlight specifically um, uh, Dr. Dennis Murray from U Trent. Harry? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so as Mike was saying, yeah, we've got you know, the well over 30 years of, of baseline data um, throughout the sort of Kwani region based out of the research station. Um, the the sort of keystone species to all of this research have been snowshoe hares, lynx, and um, red ground squirrel. Um, but we also have uh, projects that have existed from the station on, on great horned owls, um, eagles, bison, caribou, um, multitudes of other species. Uh, and one of the reasons we're able to do this is that we're, the research station sits within seven different um, eco zones sort of formed within in the region. So there's lots of different species that obviously exist within those regions, but then there's lots of opportunities for um, sort of studying in different environments, uh, different climate change proxies, different um, plants and shrub habitats and, and species throughout those biozones. And so there's uh, quite a few opportunities for uh, data comparisons, not just sort of region to region, but also sort of uh, with European species or other sort of North American species and, and environments. And so Dr. Dennis Murray from Trent University has been running a program now for about the last three years out of the station, but in five years in total, um, looking at uh, snowshoe hare in the summer and uh, lynx populations uh, in the winter. Um, sort of coming back sort of more broadly to the to the research station itself to look at kind of some of the instrumentation and, and research projects that we have based at the based physically on the research station um dr david eaton at the university of calgary um has had a gnss and seismometer installed at the research station for the last um, number of years now um he's making use of sort of a designated um, instrument pad that we have um, at the at the research station that has um, access to to power and access to, to Wi-Fi so that data can be transmitted um, and his projects um, are contributing data to, to the Earthscope, USRA, CC, CCRA, um, the sort of all kinds of national and international um, projects and, and they're quite interesting from a sort of local perspective as well as, as um, different sort of earthquakes and uh, various different impacts like that are sort of making local news. We sort of are able to collect the data um, right at the research station. Uh, Dr. James King out of the University of Montreal has had a simul photometer set up at the research station for the last couple of years. Um, and this project really got started um, sort of at, at the request of, of local, uh, local people and of, uh, of First Nations to, to get an understanding of the atmospheric um, conditions and, and air quality and sort of air constituents during the summer months um, after the Kaskawash Glacier receded, which I'll, I'll mention again shortly, um, the number of dust storms that came out of the valley from, from that glacier really increased um, quite dramatically. And so there was a lot of interest from, from local groups um, about exactly what was in that, in that sort of the particles and, and sort of what the impacts of that would be more, more broadly. So um, the instrumentation that we have at our research station is, is part of a larger array that, that Dr. King is, is sort of looking after um, and the data is starting to come now and, and is actually showing kind of what exactly is in, in the air and sort of what's um, what the impacts of that are going to be. The research station itself um, owns and maintains a, um, a weather station. Um, we 
make all the data publicly available um, and we transmit the data for use in the crown net and as part of the world meteorological organization the w wmo um, the data is transmitted through the wi-fi at the research station and this is something that we've sort of developed over the last couple of years the sort of the capacity to do this um, and so it makes data transmission for for any sort of instrumentation sort of a lot cheaper we don't have to use iridium satellites to move to move the data around um, as Mike mentioned at the top of the presentation, we sit on the largest uh, lake in, in the Yukon and so Christina Miller from the University of Calgary is one of the researchers conducting a, a project on it. Um, she is looking at, she's modelling the inputs and outputs of the lake um, which follow the redirection of the Kaskwash Glacier um, which happened about three years ago now. The toe of the glacier carved off and so that um, the meltwater now heads down a different valley instead of the valley that ultimately leads to the uh, to Kwani Lake, and so Kwani Lake itself has lost about eighty percent of its uh, incoming uh, incoming water, and so we've we've the lake itself has dropped mm, ten to twelve feet, something in that region, um, and so she's now modelling what the impacts of those changes of um, inputs and outputs is is going to be, um, and this is really a critical project from from local. From, from a local perspective and, and from a First Nations perspective, the lake is hugely important from, from a cultural perspective, food security perspective. Um, and so, so folks are really looking at this project as sort of, uh, you know, an interesting data set, an important data set coming in the next couple of years. And then she's also, Christine is also measuring the, the carbon dioxide and methane content um, and looking at sort of the, the feedback links and, and interactions from a, from a climate change perspective um, on the lake. Um, the last two slides, sort of a couple of major changes that we've had over the last sort of 12 to 18 months at the research station. Um, the first is we have been able to install a, a fairly significant renewable energy um, system. So it features uh, 50 kilowatts of solar array. The picture on the right hand side here is, is half the panels that we have installed. Um, a 48 volt battery bank, which represents about 2000 kilowatt hours. And then all of this is connected back into the existing um, diesel generator that was previously running the research station. And so what this enables us to do now is, is run in a far more sustainable manner, um, you know, far more in, in, in an off-grid manner with, with regards to using renewable energy. Um, and it also means that we have sort of power provision 12 months of, of the year without necessarily having to rely on a diesel generator. Um, and so that's, that increases our capacity to, to host researchers throughout, throughout the year, 12 months of the year, and also support instrumentation uh, 12 months of the year. Um, and and you know, be able to build out that part of the, the research station. And then a project that's getting going this year, um, the installation started uh, this last week, um, is a, a project um, looking at off-grid containerized agriculture, specifically using a, a commercial project, a product known as a crop box, which is a 40 foot um, shipping container that houses uh, a hydroponic growing environment. So it represents about a about an acre of growing space um, in sort of a traditional growing kind of uh, method. Um, it's about 18,000 LED lights and we'll be using it to, to do a couple of different things. Principally, it's a food security project to see where hydroponics could sit within a broader food security landscape for northern communities, but also to test the sort of economics of, of growing fresh produce um, in this way and to see how, how those sort of stack up compared to a sort of more urbanized setting that these things have typically been used in. The crop box is being installed at the research station later on this summer um, and it is coming with its own uh, solar energy system which is about the same size as the solar energy system that we've just installed to, to run the research station itself and so these these two renewable energy systems will, will in effect work in tandem um, one to run the crop box but two also to enhance the power, um, power availability of the station it, itself. Um, and then we'll have obviously lots of local produce, uh, lots of produce that's grown on the research station for, for people to eat when they come and stay at the station, but we'll also be distributing more widely to, to our community members and, and to folks in the local area. Um, so that's, I think that's the end of our, our slideshow. I'm, I'm sure there's, maybe there's a couple of questions. Thank you very much for this really interesting presentation and it's great to hear you have so many nice developments and, and updates going on at the station as well. Sounds very good for the future also. There were a couple of questions. I noticed Oti had sent a question in the chat and she had asked um, 
uh, what months do you typically have snow on the ground and how much is the snow depth? Um, so typically snow arrives this year it came a little early so by the end of September we had snow on the ground um, and then by the beginning of beginning of April middle of April something like that is, is typically when the snow is, has left the research station itself um, but certainly up in up in the hills and, and this route even even sort of a, a half hour walk from the research station you're, you're back into into snow um, all the hills around the research station you know not to mention obviously the ice fields are still covered so um, does that does that sort of give you give you a rough sense of, of where we are with snow yeah all the you can add if you have any any further questions uh, yes i i uh, did you reply uh to the other part of the question already or did i just miss it so uh, what is the depth typical depth of, of the snow cover that you have on the ground not in the hills or in the in the glaciers but around the station thanks sorry yes um I'd say typically we are somewhere between one to two feet. Um, it's a little bit difficult for a little bit difficult for me to gauge exactly, simply because the um, we, we're quite an open site, given that we're at the southern end of, of quite a large lake, so we do get quite a lot of wind loading. Um, but I would say sort of general coverage is one to two feet, and then obviously we've got you know wind loading and, and wind banks and so forth elsewhere. How much is that in centimeters? <laughs> Oh, crumbs. You're uh, going to be... 30 to 60 centimeters. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 30 to 60 centimeters. Sorry, I should... Uh, yes. We are pan-Arctic, so we use all those metrics. Uh, then there was a question about the laboratory, uh, about uh, do you have any distilled water or milliliter water available in the laboratory? Um, the plan is to have uh, deionized water available, um, probably tank-based. Uh, we're on a well. So we'd be withdrawing from the well, and then um, uh, we can sh ship in tanks of, of deionized water. Um, obviously, that's a lot more costly. So we're looking into processing systems that we can use to withdraw water from the well and then um, distill the water um, from there for lab use. Thank you once more, and have a nice day.